Hello again, this is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour, and we're ready to go again. Let me give out the numbers first, the ones to call in. If you want to call in during the show and ask any questions, the local number for the United States is 1-888-268-4313. 1-888-268-4313. The international number for those who want to call in from other countries is one 281 Four one nine seven six nine seven one two eight one four one nine seven six nine seven. All right. I hope everyone had a nice holiday season. Now we are just in the first week after the New Year's in the year two thousand and six. Although we never know when you people are going to download this, what time it will be. Well, that's the time we're recording and we're broadcasting right now, just after the first of the year. And we just hope this whole new year is going to bring everything, oh, maybe it'll bring peace to the world and all the things that we hope to happen. I know right here in Arkansas, we are in the middle of a very bad drought. We haven't had any rain for almost a month where they're getting too much out in California. So it seems like everything is really turned upside down with the weather and the the climate and everything. All right. Uh, What I would like to do is finish what we were talking about the last two weeks. We started at Christmas about the story of Jesus and the ones that I, what I found from my books, the Jesus and the Essenes, and they walked with Jesus. And I started Christmas with the star of Bethlehem and going through many parts of his life. And then last week, we continued on with this. But there were some important parts that I thought we needed to complete. I can't touch on everything because there's just too much. When I'm doing the lectures, I can lecture for three hours and sometimes even longer on some of these subjects. So that's why I knew it was going to have to be broken up when we got to the the parts of this. But there are some parts that have never been reported in the Bible that I think are very interesting and I think people out there should know about. The majority of these things are not told to you in church. This does not take away from the religious beliefs. I think it just adds more to it when you have more of the information. Uh, as these books, when they first came out, Jesus and the Essenes was printed in about 1992 out of England. <clears throat> and at that time, the book took off. And as I did lectures in England, a lot of people began to come up to me and they said, have you heard the legend here in England about Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea? And they said, they back up your books 100%. And I'd never heard of the the, the legends that took place in that part of the world. I had just reported what I had found and the research I had found. Now, whenever the book now has gone into its fourth or fifth printing, I know we're in our third printing here in the United States, the last edition I added an addendum to the back of Jesus and the Essenes containing a lot of this lost information that has been forwarded to me now. If I'd had it in the beginning, I probably would have included it in the book. But I didn't and began to come to me afterwards. This is quite an amazing and humbling experience to go through this on just faith and belief alone, believing you have the information and you feel you must get it out to people even though it's going against the establishment, it's going against some religious beliefs. I knew I had to write these books, and they were printed. But it's quite a humbling and wonderful experience to have people come forward to validate the information that I had found in many different ways, because I get uh, letters sent to me, I have books mailed to me, emails, many things where people can validate and prove a lot of the things that are in my books. 
this to me is very satisfying, and I really like it. And I'm grateful to my readers out there who are loyal to me and are always sending me more validation. And I welcome it. I want you to keep sending it to me. <laughs> but um, in the information that I received in, in the regressions, and then later was found with my uh, research, was that I think I told you last uh, week that uh, Joseph of Arimathea was one of the main players who has been forgotten and left out of the Bible, except for the one small mention where he was an uncle of Jesus who, I mean, he was, um, in the Bible it says he was a rich man who gave up his tomb for Jesus. But in reality, he was Joseph, was Jesus' uncle, and I think we talked about that last week. Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' uncle, and he was related to Mary, and he was one of the richest men in the world. And he was so important that they cannot understand why he was left, not put more about him in the Bible, because he was one of the most important and influential and richest men of during that time. He had fleets of ships, and he traveled all over the world trading tin, mostly. He did other things also, but the main product he uh, traded was tin, which he got from the mines, the tin mines in England. And Jesus went with him on all of these trips, studying from the wisest masters in the world at that time, the wisest teachers. And when I began telling these stories in England, this is when people came up to me and said, have you heard the legends? And they have the legends that Jesus walked the shores in Glastonbury and different areas there, and that Mary was there also, that she traveled with him at times when he was young, and the legends are still there. They said even the tin miners today have a song that they sing, and it deals with Joseph was a tin man. So the legends are still kept alive in that part of the world. But they began sending me books, and the one book that I think is very important is not very many copies out there that they sent me is called The Drama of the Lost Disciples. The Drama of the Lost Disciples. I don't have the author in front of me, but on our in our websites, and if you want to communicate with us, we can put you in touch with the publishing company in England. When I first read this book, I was blown away. It is based on solid fact where the author went to Rome and to all the other places where the records were kept and went back into old records. He found uh, letters, books, uh, stories. He found all of these things that the church had access to but never and decided never to include them in the Bible. And he, everything that he is reported on is based on very ancient facts. And after I read the book, we contacted the publishers in England because I wanted to uh, handle the book in America. And they said they weren't interested. They were a small company, and they were just going day to by day, filling the orders as they come in. They didn't want to in increase their market. So what I did was make a copy of the information about the book. And when I'm doing lectures on Jesus, I have it available if anyone wants to get this book directly from the publisher. But has anyone ever wondered what happened to all of the other characters in the Bible after the crucifixion? They never really go into all the stories. What happened to the rest of the disciples? What happened to Mother Mary? These things are never in the Bible. And what I found out was that the Fifth Council is when they decided to write the Bible. They said they had access to thousands and thousands of letters, uh, books, articles, all kinds of things. And this is what they compiled to make the Bible. A lot of people don't like to think that. They like to think that Jesus, I mean that, I'm sorry, they like to think that God wrote through the people who wrote the Bible. 
that they wrote to them, and it was actually like God was writing the entire Bible. Actually, the Bible was written by man because it was put together by these people at this council. And they were at that time decided, this is what we will include, this is what we will leave out, and this is what we will say Jesus said. So there was a great deal that was left out. Later, many years later, a lot of this information that I have found came forth. And the people who were involved with the church said, this needs to be in the Bible because it's more information and it fleshes out the story. And they said, no, it's finished, it's written, we're not going to add any more to it. So they were very aware of these other stories at the time they were putting all this together. They just chose not to include it in the Bible that has come down to us today. But in the stories that they they told us that uh, the people had me directed me to the story of the drama of the lost disciples. In that story, after the crucifixion, it wasn't very many months afterwards. The disciples were in danger. Joseph of Arimathea was in danger, and definitely Mother Mary was in danger because they were trying to kill all the ones who had been associated with Jesus. They knew they were going to have to get out of uh, Israel. Now, Joseph was so rich and powerful, they didn't know what they were going to do with him, because if they were to kill him outright, it would have created a, a big uprising. It would have created a big, a lot of problems, because the Romans, everyone, knew of his power. They devised a scheme that, to them, seemed rational. They said, we won't kill him. We will let uh, nature kill him. So what they did, they rounded everyone up, and there was Joseph of Arimathea, and he decided to take Mother Mary with him because he couldn't have left her there in Israel because she would have been in more danger by herself. Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, uh, I believe there was the other Marys that were involved with Lazarus, because Lazarus is one of the ones who went. He became a very important figure in all of this. Lazarus, as you remember from the Bible, is the one who was raised by, from the dead by Jesus. He was actually a cousin of Jesus, and he was raised from the dead, and this was the continuing part of what happened to him after the death, the crucifixion of Jesus. He was one of the people. There were 12 disciples. And they always had to be 12. Because after every time one of them was killed or one of them would die, they were replaced by another so that the number remained constant at 12. The Romans put all of these people on a boat. And in the drama of the lost disciples, it said the records vary on how many people there were all together that were put on this boat. But in some accounts, it may be as high as a 100 people. But the main characters were Joseph of Arimathea, Mother Mary, and Mary Magdalene, Lazarus. There were several other names that are mentioned in the Bible, the 12 disciples. One of these was John, the favorite son of the favorite disciple. They were all put on the boat, and it was a boat without oars and without sails. They put the boat out into the Mediterranean, and they said, we won't kill him. We'll let the ocean kill him, because how could you survive being cast out into the Mediterranean Sea in a boat with no way to propel it, no way to guide it anywhere? No oars and no sails. And it was put out into the Mediterranean. They thought they were rid of all of these people because how could they possibly survive? That is one of the greatest miracles that I've ever read. And that's why I can't figure out why it never was included in the Bible. Because, miraculously, the boat made its way across the Mediterranean 
and it came ashore on the coast of France. And the place that it came ashore at now is called San Marie de la Mar, which means St. Mary of the Sea. Saint, uh, San Marie de la Mar in um, France, on the coast of France. And it's an inlet there where there's grottoes. And they said that when it came ashore, that they all took refuge in one of these grottoes, these caves on the coast. That's one of the greatest miracles. How were they able to make it all the way across the Mediterranean with no way to guide the boat? It was almost as though it had to be divine intervention. Brought them to this, this little bitty place on the coast of France. Now, that place today has celebrations about this. So they know about the, they call it a legend, but it has been the basis of the Christian church after that. Oh, I did other another regression many, many years ago when I was first starting out that will be in another book down the road somewhere where a woman regressed to a lifetime of a gypsy and was in the 1700s. And they were going to a place where they would have their gatherings, the gathering of the gypsies once a year. They would gather at this one place and they would have their marriages and they would have any, uh, they were having any problems with law or within their communities, within the gypsies. They would have their, the judging. All of the things would take place at this once a year gathering. This gathering was at Saint-Marie de la Mar on the coast of France. And in the grotto, this is when I first heard of this legend, in this grotto, there were statues, and it was a holy place, the statues of the three Marys. Now, one of them was supposed to be Mother Mary, one was Mary Magdalene, and the other one was the third Mary, the one they claim that, oh, found the the tomb empty. There has always been three Marys mentioned in the Bible. And one of them, one of the people in the stories of the Gypsies legend, I believe it's called Sarah, but she was like a maid, a hand servant to the women who were on board the boat. She is the one who went and got help for them after they came ashore there. So she is the patron saint of the gypsies. And in the that regression about the gypsies, before they did any of the weddings, the celebrations, of the everything that they were going to do in this once a year gathering, they would go to the grotto and have a candlelight ceremony where these statues are in the grotto that uh, the legend said that the boat came ashore. So even today, once a year, they have the celebrations in this place about this is where they all came ashore. So it is a definite place that can be visited. There are some people take tours there now to tell the story of what happened. But according to the story I had, that was where they came ashore. And then after resting and after several days, they had we left again, some of them did, in a much better boat, apparently. They weren't going to take off in the one that didn't have any sails or any oars. And Joseph of Arimathea, the twelve disciples, and some of the others, especially Mother Mary, they went in a much a sturdier boat, they went to England. And this was the same place in England where Joseph had taken Jesus many times whenever they were gathering the ten and were um, he was studying with the Druids who had the university there at Glastonbury. They went there, and the very first church in the world, Christian church, was founded there at Glastonbury. Only they didn't call it a church because Jesus didn't and never intend for it to be a church. But it was the first place. And they said Lazarus went to France and he founded another church in France. 
And Mary Magdalene was responsible. I believe hers was the one in Spain. There was one in each of those countries, England, Spain, and France. It was founded by these groups, the ones who were exiled from Israel, and they thought they would die. Now, the church that they founded at Glastonbury, they never called it a Christian church because Jesus didn't want it named that. They called it the way. The way. And it was supposed to be based on Jesus' teachings. And the way it was supposed to have been done, the way he wanted it to be done, there was never supposed to be any one person over the entire organization. It was not supposed to be that way. They would meet during when Jesus was doing his travels all over Israel and Galilee and those areas, they would meet at people's houses, different places, and different people would get up and they would lecture, they would talk about what they do, they would talk about metaphysical teachings, they would show how to go into trance and how to meditate, they would show how to heal. These are the things that Jesus was doing, and this is what it was supposed to be. Just having meetings anywhere you wanted to, in people's houses or anything, and anyone could get up and share with the people there. There would never be any one person over any the whole thing telling anybody what to do. This is the way it was supposed to be. And if you read the Bible carefully, you will see Jesus said this was the way it was supposed to be. There was not supposed to be anyone like a pope or bishops or anything that would bring down laws and say this is what you must do, you cannot deviate from this. That was not the way it was intended, and the Bible even says that. Of course, these are the parts that they don't ever talk about in church. Now, here again, I'm not trying to upset anyone's belief system. I'm just laying out what I have discovered, and I always want people to think about these things and make up their own mind. Never give your power away to anyone. Use your own mind to decide what it is you want to believe. But uh, Joseph of Arimathea, Mother Mary, and the 12 disciples were all at the, the base, I guess you would say, the central base at Glastonbury. And they began to send out what we would call today missionaries all over the different areas. And they went out to share Jesus' teachings with the, the, that air was areas at that time. The reason why Joseph of Arimathea went there it to England was not only because of his connection with the tin mines, and he was very well known there, and the Druids knew him very well, but he was also connected with the ruling families in those areas. And ended up, I believe, that his his descendants intermarried with a lot of these. So there was a lot of close connections. Um the area there at Glastonbury is right around Chalice Well is where the very first church was. And that area today is called the holiest spot on earth. And when I was there a few years ago, there's an abbey at Glastonbury. It's in the town. And these bishops at the abbey know the story, and they believe in it. And they talk about the same things that I found about. The reason it is called the holiest place on earth is because all Joseph of Arimathea and the disciples were buried there. John lived to be a hundred years old, and he was buried there. But also Mary, the mother of Jesus, is buried there. And there is um, proof of that. The Abbey said they have found carvings, so they know this is true. They are all buried there where the original church was in Glastonbury. So it is called the holiest spot on earth. And then the other churches developed in France, led by Lazarus, and then the one in Spain. And um, the church knows this because in the 1400s, years after this, 
See, this all occurred within a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus. The first official church by the the uh, in Rome didn't come about till oh I believed it was three at least two to three hundred years after the crucifixion before the official Christian religion was decided and was formed and brought together. Two hundred three hundred years after the original church was founded at Glastonbury, France and Spain. The church knows about this because in the 1400s, these are official records, they had arguments about this. They wanted to settle it once and for all. Where was the first church founded? There was an argument whether the one in England or the one in France was the oldest. And it was decided it was the one in England. And it was only a matter of a year or two on the difference. So these are a matter of official records. They do know that um, this is where the actual Christian religion began by the, the direct followers of Jesus at that time. Another interesting fact that's come out was oh, they had the whole history of what happened to all of these people and what happened to each one of them. And some of the descendants went to Rome and the first Christian church outside of that area in Rome was not the Vatican. It was actually founded in a palace a few blocks away from where the Vatican stands now. And at that time, it was being used as a refuge for the different Christians who were trying to escape the persecution at that time. Now, the building, I don't believe, is there now. It may be ruins, but there is a plaque that says this was the first Christian church in Rome. They say if you go outside of the Vatican, there is also a sign that directs you to where it was. Arrows pointing down the street to where this first Christian church was. And it predates the Vatican by many hundreds and hundreds of years. So these are interesting facts that I found, anyway, that uh, what we've come across. But there was much, much more in that book called The Drama of the Lost Disciples. But um, these are important parts about what happened to all of these people. As I said last week, Mary Magdalene was a very important person, and she has been overlooked altogether because Jesus did have women disciples, and all of that has been removed from the Bible also. And she was a favorite. She was trained in Egypt, and she was an Egyptian priestess, had a great deal of Gnostic knowledge and metaphysical knowledge. And um, she was able to converse with Jesus because there were many people at that time, even his own followers, that he couldn't uh, converse with. They didn't have the metaphysical background or the knowledge that he did. That's why he was very lonely. So he really enjoyed being with Mary Magdalene so that he could talk about these things. So she was like a favorite. And they would spend many hours just away from the other disciples just talking. And the other men disciples were jealous, especially Peter. And there are many accounts of how he tried to um, undermine her as to why. Why are you giving a woman all of this attention and this, these responsibilities? This is also in the Lost Gospels of the Bible. If you can find those, they are in, in any library. Some people write to me and say, where can I find this information? One is the Gospel of Thomas. There are many of lost Gospels that are in the records if you want to go to the library and find them. And I especially encourage you to find the drama of the lost disciples. There are many other books also about the uh, adventures that Jesus had when he was a young boy there in England. And I really thank the, my readers for putting me in touch with all of this information. And I know I probably haven't... Uh, touched on all of it. I'm trying to just do it out of my memory right now. 
But um, I tell people to ask lots and lots of questions. Then make up your own mind. Don't do it because someone says this is the way it is. Ask questions, make up your own mind, and then decide what you want to believe. Your truth may not be my truth. My truth may not be your truth. But if you question and ask your question, your own self, you will find what is right for you. Then you're beginning to walk on the path of knowledge to where you can find more and more and your mind will grow and more and more information will come to you. I'm sure there's a great deal more about the story of Jesus that I haven't included. I'm trying to finish up these last <laughs> tie up the loose ends on the other ones that I have uh, opened up. A few weeks ago, I believe it was right before Christmas, I started telling the story about life after death from my book, Between Death and Life. And in the hour we had, I didn't get to finish it. There was a whole lot more than I didn't touch on. So I would like to continue with that now so that we can tie up those loose ends there's so much information in my book that I could I talk for days sometimes do week long seminars so I can go on for several weeks here before we even have any guests that um about all the information that is contained in the book so in the book between death and life it is a compilation of 15 20 years of my research that when I compiled all of the things that people told me in regression of what it was like to die and where you went afterwards. Now, I've done thousands and thousands of people, and when I take them through the death experience in the past life, they were all saying the same thing, all reporting a similarity. Now, if you have a past life regression by someone, it is very important to go through the death experience in that past life because a lot of the things that are, hap are affecting the person in this lifetime go back to the way they died in the other lifetime. Because this can be causing trauma, it can be causing phobias, it can cause physical effects, physical diseases, and uh, problems in this lifetime. So it's very important for the hypnotist to take the person through the death experience. A lot of them are afraid to. They always worry about what if something will happen to the actual physical body of the person now if they go through uh, maybe a traumatic past life. I have not found that to happen. I've done thousands and thousands of cases and they have died in every way you can possibly imagine and I've never had anyone be affected by going through the death experience. They have, in fact, benefited by it because they have found the answers to some of their problems in this lifetime. Of course, any of these things could only be attempted by qualified hypnotists who know what they're doing. It's like anything else. If you don't understand the uh, procedure and if you don't understand what to watch for, there could be harm but it's only because of inexperience or someone trying to do something, try something different that they have not worked with before. When I teach my classes, I'm very um, adamant about this, that you must take care of the person, you must protect them and be uh, conscious of their welfare at all times when you are working with them. Anyway, uh, when I did this about three weeks ago, I believe, I talked about how you died, what the body felt like whenever the person died, and I began talking about where the person goes on the other side, that I found three different places where the person would go according to their development. It all has to do with vibrations and frequencies. If these vibrations and frequencies don't mesh, you wouldn't be able to go to these different levels. You can only proceed as far as you, uh, your abilities will take you, your development will take you. You can't go to the higher levels where the masters are 
until you're all ready to get there. You have to go through the lessons of life, and if, you know, before you're you're allowed to proceed. It's just it's like a school. I've said that before. Life is a school, and then this is a school where you can repeat a grade, but you can't skip a grade. You can't go any faster than your development. And if you don't do good in the class, you're going to have to come back and do it again. So the same thing happens on the other side. Whenever you pass over, you will go to the place that you are suitable with, you are compatible with. Now, hopefully, you may go back to the same place that you left, but hopefully you're not going to go down lower to another level. The idea is to progress upward, to keep going up the ladder to where you finally get to the point that you don't have to come back anymore. That's the whole idea. But because of the lessons of life, a lot of times people have to take it over again. But I found the three places that they went to, and I reported in the last talk, about the first level. This was the lower astral. And that's where the, where the people who were earthbound spirits, those who had died um, from oh, drug overdoses or, or alcohol, the ones who were in the lower escalon, I guess you would say, the ones who were not aware of the spiritual part of themselves. They were very much into the physical and they didn't understand they had a soul. They didn't understand what happened to them when they did die and when they crossed over. And many of them were earthbound and stayed here. But I also talked about how you have a guide who is with you your entire life. And this guide will meet you and take you where you're supposed to go. I call them the greeters. They were never alone. They would always take you to where you're supposed to go. But some of the earthbound spirits are not aware of these readers, these guides that are there. And they keep trying to get back into a body, trying to get back into the physical world, because, try to go back to where they lived, because this is all they knew. They didn't know anything about the spiritual development and about what it was all about to proceed and go on to the other levels. They were more or less stuck. And I also talked about the middle astral, which most people associate with the version of heaven. This was a place very much like what we're told heaven is like. Very beautiful. And there are lots of houses on the sides of the hill. And you can live in any kind of a house that you wanted to. There was music in the air. Beautiful colors beyond imagination. This beautiful, wonderful place that you could spend eternity, our soul, the person thinks. And you could live in these houses with your family that had deceased or with friends. And they think more or less heaven is continuation of the life they had just left. And it, it's all right for a while. The problem is you can't stay there because in life you accumulate karma. There are lessons to be learned. And you cannot um, go, you know, go over there to remain until you have worked out the karma and have uh, finished this life lesson. So sooner or later, these people would have to go before the board and go over their life lessons and review the karma and then have to agree to come back and repay the karma with those that they have harmed in some way in the previous life. And as I said before, too, there is no one judging you like the church wants to tell you. There is no one there with an iron fist or a rod judging you and saying you're going back to be punished or you're going to be thrown into hell. There is no one like that there. You review your life with your guides and the masters and the elders. They'll go over it and point out a lot of different things. And you see what you have done. You see those you have hurt. 
you see how even what you said to them made a big difference. And you are the one who judge yourself. You see what you have done, and then you say, I didn't realize it hurt them like that. I must go back and repay this. You judge yourself. You are the ones that decide what kind of punishment, if you want to call it that, that you will receive when you come back. You are the ones that write the script, so to speak. You are the judge, and there can be no harsher judge than you yourself. And I've been told that the quickest way to get rid of karma, but not necessarily the easiest way, is just to forgive. Forgive the person and let it go. Don't dwell on it. Just cut it loose and let it go. And people tell me, I can't. You don't know what that person did to me. I can't. Let do. Just let it go. If you don't, you're going to have to come back and do it again with the same people because you can't go on until you have repaid all of this and let it go and just tear up the contract and release it. And then comes one of the hardest parts is forgiving yourself. Many people can't do that. But this is all what is part of it, because then the next time around, or maybe the rest of this life will be easier, but the next time around will definitely be easier, because you'll be going into a different kind of a message, a different kind of lesson in the school as we progress during through the different grades. Anyway, we had got as far as the upper astral, which is the part that I like. That's the part that I consider what heaven would really be like, because that would be the most fascinating of all. The upper astral, where I told you about the Temple of Wisdom complex. The Temple of Wisdom has all of these many, many different parts. The one part was where the Temple of Healing was. And I spoke about that. I'm trying to keep from repeating a lot of the same information because you can download the other talk. The Temple of Healing, and then the Tapestry Room, which is the Tapestry of Life. And it shows that each one of us has a thread in this Tapestry of Life. And it's all interwoven. And each thread represents all of the lives we've ever lived and it's all interwoven to show how we have touched many, many people in our lives, multiple lives. All of these threads cross and touch each other, each one, and shows, although we're one little individual thread, we are also all, because we're all interwoven and we're all interconnected, showing that what one person does affects the whole. It affects everyone. If we only knew these things and understood them, there would be so much easier in the world. We would be doing what Jesus wanted us to do. He said if there was love in the world, love was the key. If there was love in the world, there would be no violence. There would be no wars. There would, wouldn't be the problems that we had today. If there was love in the world, we wouldn't have to keep coming back and repaying karma either because we would realize how closely knit all of us are together, how each one of us influences the others. And it's it's very powerful, these lessons are. Some of these, I think, would really solve a lot of problems if they were taught in the churches. But then the next place, after the tapestry room, I had just begun to talk about the library and the schools when we ran out of time. The library is my favorite because I'm a writer, and to me, libraries are my, my favorite places. I can get lost in a library. I can spend an entire day in a library looking for one little piece of information. And then to find that, oh, it's so wonderful. To me, that's heaven. <laughs> to do the, be able to do the research and to look through volumes and volumes of books, to find
find one little piece of information to back up something that I've written about. So libraries are so important to me. So my version of heaven would naturally be this huge library that is in the Temple of Wisdom complex. In that library are all the books about everything that has ever happened and everything that ever will happen on every subject, known or unknown. It is just a tremendous volume of information. And if you don't want to do it with books, you can do it with rooms that are on the side. They showed me these rooms that if you went into the room and you said what it was you wanted to know about, the information would be shown as a scene around you like a holograph, like you're in the middle of a holograph, and you would see it happening all around you. This is how I got a lot of the information that I've written about. Some of the people that I was working with went into the rooms rather than going through the books for the information. Especially the in my convoluted Universe Book 1, where I had the whole section on Atlantis, some of the information came from the person viewing it in these holograph rooms where they could see it. So it can be done in many different ways, but the libraries are tremendous. And they have the schools. In the schools, everything imaginable can be taught. Every subject that has ever been known to man and many that are not known to man on every subject imaginable are taught in these schools. That, to me, is heaven. I can't imagine people's version of heaven as floating around on a cloud playing a harp. That would be so boring. I want knowledge. I want information. To me, the schools would be a tremendous way to find information. And they said you could learn absolutely anything that you needed there. So I asked them, all right, if you can learn anything you want in these schools on the upper astral, why do you need to come back to the world? Why do you need to come back to the physical to learn? They said, Yes, it's possible you can learn everything you want over there, but it's much slower. You can learn it much faster in a physical body living on Earth. They said it is the same thing as hands-on healing, uh, hands-on experience versus book learning. You can learn a lot of things from books. You go to the to college, you study chemistry. You're in the laboratory, you're reading the books. Sure, it tells you all about chemistry in the book. But do you really understand chemistry until you go into the lab to the laboratory and begin mixing the different uh, chemicals together to see what's going to happen? Or if you're reading a book about how to tear an engine apart, a car engine apart, you really learn it until you begin practicing it and start actually tearing the physical inner engine apart and putting it back together again. This is what I mean by book learning versus actual hands-on. That over there in those schools, they can talk about all the things that a physical person goes through, all of the emotions, the trauma, the everyday things that happen to the person. And you would say, oh, yeah, that doesn't sound so bad. I can do that. It's not that hard. I can do all those things. Love, hate, jealousy, that doesn't sound too hard. I can do that. And so you make the agreement to come back to experience it. But when you actually get here and you're in the life, then you're living the emotions. You're experiencing the emotions from other people. It's very real. It's not like reading it in a book. 
there's where the difference is. The book learning versus the hands-on. And you learn so much faster because you are interacting with the people and seeing how your emotions react, how they, you feel them, and how they, other people feel them around you. That is the way you learn. It's difficult. It's hard. I tell people when I'm lecturing about this, all of us have had bad things happen to us. That's what life is all about. Life gets in the way. We've all had bad things happen to us. But did you learn anything from it? If you look at it and you really ask yourself, what did I learn from that? Sure, it hurt. There was a lot of things that were very bad. But did I learn even one little thing from the incident. If you learned even one little thing, that was what it was all about, to teach you, to make you grow, to make you advance. Otherwise, you're going to have to do it again until you get that lesson. But if you learned something from the experience, that's what it was all about. This is progression. When we come back, we make contracts with all of these other people that we have karma with, and we hopefully are going to repay it this time. Before you come back, you write your contract, and you say, all right, I'm going to do this and that, and I'll get it all worked out. So you come down with your nice little plan of what it is you want to accomplish, what it is you hope to accomplish. You come down with it all wrapped up like a Christmas package. Say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'll get it all finished, and then I'll go back, and I will have to do it again. The problem is everybody else is coming in with their nice little plan. And this is planted a free will. Everyone do what they want. They have the free will. So they are all coming in with their nice little plan that seems so simple on the other side. They come down here, and what happens? These things clash. Everybody with their own little plan, and life gets in the way. It doesn't work out the way they thought it was going to work out. I had one person, after they went through the whole life and went through the death experience, at the end of it, they said, what happened? I had it all figured out. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. What happened? Life happened. That's what it was all about. So, anyway... The whole secret of this whole thing is you begin with God, you come to learn lessons, you go from life to life learning lessons, and then when you have finally learned everything there is to learn, the final goal is to return once again to God and reunite with God. We have to go full cycle. We take back all of the knowledge, everything we have learned in all of our lifetimes and accumulated. We take that information back to God because this is what he wants. He wants the accumulation of knowledge, the accumulation of information, the emotions, everything you have learned. You take it back to God when you have finally completed the entire cycle, which could take in our time span, it could take eons to complete everything. You cannot do it in one life. It's impossible. It's an accumulation of information. You travel a full circle and then you go back. In that way, we are like cells in the body of God. We are cells in the body of God, accumulating information and releasing it to him when we finally complete our life journey and go back. Well, we're coming to the, the end of the time again. 
and there's still more that I can talk about with this. Hopefully, I'll be finishing up these different subjects, and then we can go on to something else. All right? But the main thing I want to tell people is if they want to find out more about the book, you can find out more from our website. It's www.ozarkmountain, the next company, but this, this is abbreviated. It's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com, the abbreviation for mountain, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. On this website, you can find out my schedule of where I'm speaking at all over the world. And also, it has about my classes that I give. And if anyone is interested in private sessions, or if they want to sign up for the class, or if they want to uh, have me speak at any conferences, they can contact through our website. And if they want to call, the number is 1-800-935-0044. One eight hundred nine three five zero zero four five. And if they want to communicate directly with me, the email is D E Cannon C A N N O N at M S N dot com. All right. A happy New Year. We're into the New Year. Let's have a good life. If you enjoyed the show. Check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.